Welcome to part one of our five part series on plantar fasciitis. If you've been told you have plantar fasciitis, you're definitely going to want to watch this entire series for two reasons. The first is that we're going to make sure you are doing the right treatments and not wasting your time and money. And second, there's a really good chance that you've been misdiagnosed. We're going to walk you through everything that is wrong with how you got diagnosed and what you could actually have. Hey, it's Glenn here from Mehab, the world's leading physical therapy alternative, where we educate and empower you to take control of your recovery. If you're new here, make sure you click that subscribe button, and all the links we mentioned in the video can be found in the description below. As always, this information is meant for educational and demonstration purposes only. With that out of the way, let's get into it. I've treated patients with and personally experienced plantar fasciitis. I did and gave the traditional treatments, and eventually they and I got better but something didn't seem quite right. So today I'm going to clear up some misinformation and give you the real deal on everything plantar fasciitis. Make sure you watch all the videos to help you understand your problem and why I believe you could have been misdiagnosed. The plantar fascia is more accurately called the plantar aponeurosis. It's a thick fibrous layer of tissue on the bottom of your foot that's divided into three bands, medial, lateral, and central. Its job is to stabilize the arch of the foot and provide some shock absorption. Plantar fasciitis is believed to be the inflammation of the plantar fascia from overstretching or overloading. While that is sort of true, it is usually caused by a cascade of events. The suffix itis implies inflammation. However, biopsies show tissue degeneration versus inflammation. Therefore, a more appropriate term is plantar fasciosis. There can be an inflammatory response, which typically lasts around three to seven days, so symptoms beyond a week without a re-aggravation or re-injury are unlikely to be due to inflammation. This explains why there's usually little to no change with anti-inflammatories and why cortisone shots are not often effective beyond one month. So what is the cause of plantar fasciitis? You will hear all types of reasons for why you got plantar fasciitis. Calf weakness, ankle weakness, tight hips, misaligned hips, you pronate too much, you supinate too much, it's your shoes, it's high arches, no, it's from flat feet. The reality is it is rare that any of these things actually matter. You didn't just develop pronation or flat feet. Calf weakness or tightness doesn't happen unless there's a serious neurological event. These quote unquote problems have been with you for decades. Most people with flat feet or overpronation have had it their entire life. And your plantar fasciitis started a few months ago but now all of a sudden pronation or flat feet is causing it. Why didn't it happen 10 years ago? It doesn't make much sense. Pronation is the classic villain in this movie and in many movies in fact. If you were to believe what everyone says, having pronation is essentially the beginning of the end. Apparently it's the cause of foot pain, ankle pain, knee pain, hip pain, back pain, and some will even claim it can cause shoulder and neck pain. It's just not true. The reality is that it's never been proven to be the cause of any of these things. People that pronate and people that supinate both get plantar fasciitis. It's what everyone says, but the claims are not supported. Pronation does not necessarily lead to lower extremity problems, and research has found that excessive pronators are no more likely to get injured than those without it. Tight calves. This is another classic condition blamed for causing plantar fasciitis, but again, there is very poor correlation. Tightness is really just the sensation and stretching only alters that sensation, giving the perception of being looser. Stretching in itself is a misconception we'll cover in another post, but stretching does not actually change tissue length, at least not permanently. It can temporarily decrease the stiffness of tissue. Given that stretching does not change tissue length, that the plantar fascia needs your toes bent backwards to increase tension, and that there is no direct connection between the plantar fascia and the Achilles tendon, it seems that tight calves have little to do with it at all. In theory, if having tight calves was actually a thing, it could cause earlier weight transfer to the forefoot and the toes, but most people compensate with shorter step length and external rotation of the foot. Weight has also been correlated to plantar fasciitis, with research reporting overweight people are at a greater risk of developing it. My question is, is it purely weight or load that causes plantar fasciitis, or is it related to the composition of that weight? What is its prevalence in lean people with high body weight, like a bodybuilder? And why does it not happen to all overweight people? This indicates that weight increases alone and not suffice. Weight is usually gained gradually and tissue will adapt to the increased stress, a subject we will touch on later in the series. 
It is clear that weight alone is not enough in and of itself to cause plantar fasciitis. With increased body fat, there is an associated chronic low-level inflammation that has been shown to weaken collagen. This results in lowering a tissue's tolerance to stress, and thus an increased likelihood of damage. This could reasonably explain why the prevalence is higher with obesity. It may be activity related, as tissue will adapt and get stronger if progressively loaded. A more sedentary lifestyle may limit the ability of the tissue to develop resistance to forces. Age. There is a body of literature on the association of plantar fasciitis with increasing age. Age-related degenerative changes may cause a decrease in the elasticity and the ability to absorb shock, resulting in the plantar fascia being more prone to injury. Additionally, older athletes seem to suffer from plantar fasciitis more often than younger athletes. Systemic diseases and disorders play a role in decreasing the tolerance of connective tissue to forces. Factors that affect microcirculation of blood, such as hardening of the arteries, abnormal lipid profiles, tobacco use, and diabetes, have all been linked to an increased risk of developing plantar fasciitis. People with immune system diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis, have also been shown to have an increased risk. Overuse and overload. The primary belief of the cause of plantar fasciitis is overloading and thus overstretching of the tissue, resulting in damage. And I agree that this is likely, however, what I disagree with is which structure is actually damaged. All injuries are simply the result of exceeding a tissue's tolerance. This could be a one-time high force event like a fall or a car accident, or a repetitive low load event as in the case of overuse injuries. If you think back to the start of your symptoms, there's usually a precipitating event, such as a large increase in activity, such as joining a gym, increased work or prolonged walking, rapid weight gain or illness. There is typically something that triggers it. It's pretty clear that the cause of plantar fasciitis is multifactorial. It explains why the demographics and precipitating events vary so much. As stated earlier, I believe that the injury occurs as a result of tissue's tolerance being exceeded. It is also clear that there are systemic factors that lower tissue tolerance, making normally harmless activities now enough to damage the tissue. This falls in line with the popular overuse overload theory, but I believe it is not the plan of fashion that gets damaged in every person. In fact, I believe it is actually rarely the plan of fashion. In the next video, we're going to review how plantar fasciitis is typically diagnosed and why the diagnosis of plantar fasciitis is flawed and not as straightforward as we are led to believe. Before you head out, please hit the like button, share us with your friends, and so you don't miss out on any of the other parts of the series, be sure to click the subscribe button and notification bell. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on the next one.